Welcome to On the Same Page. I'm Tommy Sanders, and once again this time we are coming to you from that bookstore at Montebank Place here in Conway, Arkansas. Now, if you're an Arkansas family or an Arkansan in general who's into the outdoors, you likely have a copy of this book lying around the house somewhere, The Buffalo River Country, written, photographed by Ken Smith. Well, Ken Smith has a brand new book out. It's a little bit different approach. It's called Buffalo River Handbook. And we're thinking this is a book that's going to be seen in a lot of Arkansas homes in the years to come. We will visit with the author, Ken Smith, and a panel of Arkansas readers, so stick around. Ken Smith is the author and photographer for the Buffalo River Handbook, and uh, Ken Smith also for the Buffalo National River has been a conservationist, a park planner, a designer and production supervisor, and on many of the river's hiking trails as well. You're working on one now, as a matter of fact. Is that true? That's right, Tommy. And boy, is it fun. <laughs> I can imagine. I can't tell you. <laughs> well, let's talk about how much fun you had writing this book. What, what was the impetus for the writing of this book? You had the big book, of course, the, the Buffalo River Country book, which so many Arkansans have seen, so many own. But what was, the, what was the, the need for this book? What did you set out to do? A lot of things, I think. Just I've been around the Buffalo a long time, and it was time to share uh, some things that I'd picked up in the way of knowledge. And I was always curious. Uh, I am always curious, and I wanted to find out more. And so I went about finding out more from a lot of experts uh, and geologists, biologists, historians, and so on. This is what I would call a second-generation guidebook. The first generation guidebook is usually telling you uh, where to go, how to get to the trails, how to get on the river and so forth. I wanted to get back into the why and get more depth. One of the things I got interested in was the names, the place names. Um, I was helping put together a book, or rather a map, two maps mm -hmm. of the Buffalo for Trails Illustrated. They're part of National sure, Geographic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and there were some blank spots on the map, and fortunately, I found that old folks who could fill one, one man in particular lives near Big, Big Flat, uh, down near the Lower River. Uh -huh. And he gave me information uh, about the names of hollows and, and ridges and down there. Well, let me, ask you, let me ask you right now, who named it the Buffalo River? When did it get that name? We don't know. Uh, Probably the Indians, uh, but maybe the first French hunter or trapper that came up the White River that far in the 18th century and saw the buffalo that were present at that time. Uh, you know, buffalo were not only on the Great Plains, they were all over the eastern United sure, States, absolutely. scattered around, not as many. But there were pr probably a noticeable number uh, in the barrens or, or prairies uh, near the Buffalo, and so it became the Buffalo River. Yeah. Somebody named it. Somebody did, the because of the bison uh -huh. that were there. Not really buffalo, I guess, actually. Bison. Well, right. bison, uh, yeah. the American bison, right. is, is the buffalo. Yeah. Well, your history goes way back, much farther than that, as a matter of fact. The book is, is in fact, in three parts. You have sort of a uh, first part being the source book. You've also got a guide to a, a, pretty much a float down the river and also a guide to the hiking trails of the river. But the source book starts out 500 million years ago. That's a lot to bite off. Well, around 500 million was when the, the, the rock uh, that is present along the buffalo was laid down as sediment uh, in ancient seas. And the seas came and went, uh, and various layers, uh, different types of rock were laid down from time to time over 100 and, what is it, 180 million years, I believe it is. And... So there it is now. Of course, uh, about 300 million years ago, the land became land permanently. It was not submerged again. And that was when the erosion that shaped that country began. So water and wind is the reason we have these magnificent cliffs that everyone associates with the buffalo. Huh? Yeah, and it, it has happened in ways we don't know, or at least the sequence of events over 300 million years is, is uh, not certain. Uh, we can guess at it, 
But as the old German said, I was not there. <laughs> that's right. That's <laughs> so, the long and the short of it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. We, we weren't there to know, but it is fascinating. And you can read the book and get an idea of, of, of those trademark cliffs and how they came about through the years. Also, some extensive writing on the biological diversity of this area, which is, uh, you say, akin to more higher Appalachian type climates than it is to maybe the rest of Arkansas as a whole. Well, various climates, uh, and, and the climate has changed over thousands and millions of years. Uh, the, what can I say, the, another thing is that you have a variety of, of uh, exposures today that make for very different uh, life forms or collections of life forms. The south side of a ridge up there can be entirely different in its plant community from the north side. And I guess that goes for animals to a certain extent, too. Yeah, so, too. That's why you see the, the big beech forests on the north sides of ridges and something different on the south side, yeah, right? Uh, yeah. Greenbrier. Greenbrier, that's what you call it. <laughs> Sun-loving plant called Greenbrier. Greenbrier, that's, that's what <laughs> the south sides know that very well. Are. Yeah. Well, it's all in the book, very fascinating. And then, of course, we go through the human history as well in this first section of the book. A lot of highlights there. And as you mentioned, a lot of uh, articles that you work up and work into the text and sometimes just set there as inserts Visits with people, like you mentioned, the, the people who've given you the human mm -hmm. history that's, that's not written down. You, you had to do a lot of legwork to get a lot of these things. Well, a lot of that history, of course, is tied into specific places, and it was an idea of giving some depth to the history of a place like Woolham, which is nothing more than a landing on the river, but it was, had an identity as a community or just across the river in Richland Valley uh, in the trail guide to talk about uh, the community of Point Peter. Uh, it all had pretty well disappeared 50 years ago, but back in the 19th century, it had a post office. A lot and, of lost towns and communities all up and down the oh, yeah. There. It's really fascinating uh -huh. to read about them in the book. And the, the human history kind of concludes with your account of, of how the river escaped being dammed for hydroelectric and flood control purposes, which is really remarkable for a river of that length anywhere in this country, right? That was a controversy that went on for 10 years, and it is typical, more or less, of all the controversies that have taken place over the creation of national park areas. There is always a local community looking for economic betterment and a larger community of people from outside the area who see the place as unique in a larger sense, unique in the case of any national park area, I'd say, unique in the entire United States. And the Buffalo is the most spectacular scenery of any river in the Ozarks. Now, over in Missouri, they have the Current River uh, mm -hmm. with its beautiful springs, but the higher bluffs on the Buffalo are, in a sense, a match for those features on the Current River. So it's really a treasure, and, and we're lucky to have it. I guess we can all agree on that. That's the first part of the book, the, the source book, which I, I've, I've been through as much as I can in the short time I've owned the book, and it's really fascinating. The second two parts of the book equally as fascinating. The, the part number two it's pretty much a float down the buffalo. It's, it's every inch of the river. How did you manage to put all that information? I guess, I guess you just go down and write it down as you go, or do you, do you well, dictate to yourself, or I how does it work? I take notes sometimes. Uh, of course, a lot of that uh, float along the river is tied into the, the uh, features, the historic features and natural features that are touched on in the first part mm -hmm. of the book. I see the, 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 the book is really interlocking uh, the, the, what you have in that first part is, is just building you up to the yeah, river sort of guide and up, the trail yeah. guide yeah. in the third part of the book. And you, you go over every, how many miles of trails? A hundred and, what is it, 120, 130 miles of trails in the Buffalo River? Uh, area? About 120 miles of trail. I've never shaved it down very finely to find out exactly. Have you but, trod uh, every step of that? Just about, uh-huh. I guess I have every step. You've built a lot of the trail. Built a lot of trail. Uh, we have used volunteers over the years, the last since the late 1980s. Also, a Park Service trail crew for a few years. Uh, they had an appropriation to build trails uh, in the vicinity of uh, Tyler Bend, for example, and we had a 
an employed crew, I was supervising them. Mm. But more of the time with volunteers, and they have come from all over the country at times because we've used national organizations to, like the Sierra Club and American Hiking Society, to recruit these volunteers. At one time, I had counted, I think, 30 states and two or three foreign countries uh, that were represented among these volunteers. Well, that's fascinating, too, and of course, that's part, I guess, the river doesn't change, the history doesn't change, but as you revise this book in the years to come, the trails are what you're going to have to revise the most, right? That's right. You, you've hit it. Uh, and that when we have, we're building or just beginning to build next year uh, a 25-mile stretch of trail. If it's done principally, principally with volunteers, it's going to take several years, five, six years maybe. Uh, and when that 25 miles is complete, certainly I would hope to uh, come out with a revision, just yeah. an expansion of the book, really. To add some more pages in there, because that'll be some fascinating stuff. Yeah. Going, I think you told us from 60, Highway 65 to Highway 14, so that'll That's be right, about 25 some, miles. Some good new stuff. Is there an overall purpose, do you have an overall purpose in the book to inspire people to treasure the buffalo, to protect the buffalo, to look after the buffalo in the years to come? Tommy, you're hitting at it right there. and. At the very end of the book, <clears throat> there's an obscure little uh, section called Conclusion. Two pages, I believe. And that is what I hope everybody will read and take to heart. Uh, it means not only protecting the buffalo, but thinking about the larger problem of environment, people, and consumption. There are three parts to that little uh, balance or equation and I think that is the largest problem facing uh, people worldwide really. It's not really, it's not Arkansas, just, it's just not the, the United it's States, all. it's yeah. not North America, it's the worldwide problem uh, that we have and what we do in that larger context with that larger problem is going to affect the quality of the Buffalo River, uh, that we will have to, uh, things from outside the Buffalo River are going to have impact on the Buffalo at, and at the same time our life and lives in general. Can it stay the way it is for another 400, 500 years, another if, millennium? If we and succeeding generations take care of it, if we come to a balance between that balance between population, consumption, resources, then we will have the Buffalo River, our children and their children will have it on through the generations. Right. The book is called The Buffalo River Handbook. Ken Smith is the author and photographer, and don't forget to read the conclusion, right? That's right. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll have a panel of Arkansas readers and experts on the buffalo, you might say, to talk more about this book, so stick around. All right, we're back, ready to talk to our readers about the Buffalo River Handbook. Want to introduce them to you right now, including Larry Foley. Larry Foley, Associate Professor of Journalism at the University of Arkansas, award-winning independent film producer. And uh, before he became so independent, he was actually a full-time producer for this network, for AETN. So it's good to have Larry Foley back here. Dana Stewart is a writer, formerly taught at Hendricks College and other places as well. Works with the Little Rock Writing Project. Uh, has won the top nonfiction award from the Arkansas Literary Society, and we should, uh, in, in the sense of disclosure, say she's a member of the Ozark Society, who are the publishers of the That's Buffalo right. River Handbook. So now we got all that out on the table. And Mike Mills, the founder and operator of the Buffalo Outdoor Center, which was set up, I guess, when the, the National River designation was pretty much brand new up there in North Arkansas, and he has done an incredible amount of work for tourism in Arkansas in general, the Buffalo in particular, and sort of the face of the Buffalo River. When the people from the magazines and the TV networks come to the <laughs> Buffalo, they find this guy and talk to him about the Buffalo River. So thank you all for being here. I'm assuming you've all read the book. Is this a book you sit down and read? Or do you, do you keep it like you, like you keep the encyclopedia? You, you go for what you need when you need it? Both. You've read it all, Dana? I've read it all, and I enjoyed it as a read, but I also plan to take it with me when I canoe. Using it for both. Mike, did you read it all? Yes, sir, uh, and, and I would agree with that. Uh, Ken says that you're supposed to take it off and just read bits and pieces, but 
uh, certainly the the entire book is real readable and you learn so much in doing so and then I can understand the going back and getting it again because you can't digest it all the first time so you're right. going to have to go back and, and really when you're there on the spot is when it or, or at the evening after whatever is when it would really be great. Sure. That's when it could really come alive for you. Have you read it all Larry? Absolutely Tommy you know there are books out about that have a lot of pretty pictures in them and mm -hmm. this has nice pictures too and, and and books out there about hiking the trails, but one of the things that I think Ken does a really good job with this is that he really tells the history, the whole story of the buffalo, the, you know, the geology, the natural history of the buffalo, story of the people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, uh, the mining, the, you know, the, the floaters, the early settlers, the pioneers, and it's a really good read. So I think it's, it's actually two things. It's a good book if you like the buffalo. It's a place that you, you want to go to or you've been in the past. And it's also a good book to, you know, to, to throw in the car when you're going to go up there and float or hike the sure. next time yeah. because yeah. it's a good reference and it'll take you to some interesting places that maybe Ken's been to that you'd like to go to. Yeah, absolutely. You have won awards for your research. Just your research. Not, not, let's not even talk about your films, but your research. And how would you rate the quality of Ken Smith's research on this book? It's very thorough, very complete. Um, it's cr the book is crisply written, which as a journalism teacher I think is important. It's a real interesting read. Uh, Ken is meticulous with the information that he has, uh, has acquired for this book. And I would, um, I would rate this an important uh, piece of work, uh, Tommy. Uh, important for not only those of us who want to go to the Buffalo now and who are interested in the story, but uh, let's just say that, that I'd like to do a documentary on the buffalo, which is not a, a half bad idea. I, I think that this is... <laughs> well, you is, don't make that you, You've been wanting to do that for a long time. Exactly. Yeah. I think yeah. this is the first place you go, right here. All right. That's, 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 that's a good point. Great point. Danny, you are an Ozark Society member. You're, you're a writer and a writing teacher, so you're going to be a tough customer to please with a book like this. How does it stack up for you? Well, beyond all that, on a personal level, Ken says he was a curious guy who wanted to right. know more. Yeah and want to know why. And as a writer and writing teacher, I think there's a large piece of us that wants to do that. So he tells us why, and he does a good job of telling us why. I agree it's crisply written, but also it's charming narrative at times, charming narrative, uh, armchair narrative. The, the source book is uh, the first part of the book. Um, is just a good read. And you read this, and, and you, 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 you find all this wonderful information, but you sort of take for granted, you know, that this is easy to write. It's not easy to take it's this wrong. raw information and transform it into something that's readable, right? In fact, I think the reader, that is a difficulty for the reader. There is so much here that accessing it, you just sort of have to, to go with the way Ken goes. And dog ear. That's here right. And too. That's right. <laughs> or are you going to highlight it? See, I've got a lot of Yeah, that, yeah, look, at see, yeah, that's, I, I guess, right. yeah, that's why they say you shouldn't dog ear because yeah. books are your friends and you wouldn't do that to your friends. Mike, you are... You walk, you've been through every inch of the Buffalo River. You are the walking encyclopedia of the Buffalo River, uh, along with uh, Ken. And uh, how does the book stack up with you? Well, I, I certainly uh, am flattered that you'd put me even in that category. Uh, uh, I, Everybody I, knows I, that. I, I, I don't think that I am a walking encyclopedia of the Buffalo. Much of what I have learned came from Ken's first book, the Buffalo River Country right. book. Right, great and, book. And, and that's what, this is just an extension a, a, a vast greater extension of that book. Uh, the river mileage, the, the names of the bluffs, the names of the swimming holes, the, and, and not only the names, but how that name got attached to yeah. that spot. Uh, those are things that an interpreter like myself, who deals with thousands of tourists a year, I can use that as a resource to, to draw a more educated a picture for a guest. And to humanize and, and, a lot of the and, places. And, humanize. Too. And, and I've done that for years, once again, uh, not only from my own experience, but basically using Ken Smith's uh, uh, research that he did on his first book. All he has done is just done a whole lot more research and, and applied it in a different manner. And when, when, it's used, when it's, the title of it is Buffalo River Handbook, that's exactly what it is. I mean, this is the type of book that you put right beside the Webster's Dictionary in the Bible. Because that's what it is. <laughs> it is. It, it, it's it's the it's the book that you're going to refer to over and over again about the Buffalo River. It is the essential, and it is the encyclopedia of, of the Buffalo River. I guess as as far as we have right now, the style is very straightforward. And Dana mentioned that it's it's very what we call transparent in that it, it's it's it doesn't attempt to editorialize. You don't 
you don't read it and say, wow, this guy's really trying to write real hard. <laughs> you know, it's very straightforward. And that's hard writing to do. Well, yeah. I mean, it's harder than it sure. seems because it, it seems very easy to read and you think, well, you know, this is, this is easy, but it's not, is it? I, I don't remember who said this, but, but I've heard it said that good writing goes unnoticed. Right. You know, you're not really exactly. paying attention to the, to the prose. You're just looking at the information. And, and he, he brings forth some really interesting stories. Even if you think you know the Buffalo River and you know the story, well, maybe you don't know that, the, that Tyler Bend was named after a guy who, uh, either him or his family, I think it was him, uh, you know, the people that lived up on the Buffalo, Tommy, tried to stay out of the Civil War. They tried not to, to take a side, and, uh, and the Confederates came up there and got these guys and dragged them off to the war, and Mr. Tyler died in the war. So who knew that? As many times as I've been to Tyler Bend, who knew that story? I didn't know it until I, I read I this. And, and there are lots of little, my favorite stories are always the stories about people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people may not know that, that uh, and it's in here, that... Uh, Orville Faubus had quite a bit to do with the river not being dammed. You know, we think of, of Governor Faubus for other more infamous things, mm -hmm. uh, but you'll find that in the book. And, and there are lots of things about, about the people, uh, the place names, the, 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 the impact that various people had uh, on the, in fact, Thomas Hart Benton, you know. Was sure, absolutely. A very, very big fan, part of the book. Big yeah. part, and, yeah. and some of his artwork is in there. And I found that fascinating. Mm -hmm. A lot of things I didn't know about him and, and how often he would come right. to the Buffalo Rivers. It's really quite fascinating. Ken Smith has resisted the temptation to overtly editorialize in I this agree. book. He does not, but he lets the facts do the talking. Do you like that? Or would you rather have a little more opinion, a little more uh, passion in there? No, I was thinking about it. And uh, probably one of the greatest gifts that Ken gives us is simply to tell the story. Uh, even the even the controversy of the river, uh, the Ozark Society has other other books that talk about that controversy. Mm -hmm. But Ken simply says, "This is what happened," and you're allowed to form your own take on that. Uh, he does not try to take you over, and uh, that was to me very good writing. Also, he assumes that the reader is fa fairly intelligent. Person, he assumes which is a the rare reader thing these days. exactly. <laughs> yeah. He assumes the reader is going to have a mind and bring it to bear in that book. That's really good. That's that's one of the main attributes to me of the book. And what would you like to have seen more of, Mike Mills, in the book? Or do you think it's pretty complete? I can't really. I, I guess the only thing that you could add to it was more of Ken's photographs because ha having seen Ken's photographs, ha how he got down to the few photographs that he put in the book would have been a nightmare. Because going from 5,000 to 200 would have been easy, but from 200 down to how many are rare in the book would have just been a, 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 a huge uh, chore. Because I know his photography, and he's got fabulous stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, I thought he did a really great job of even some stuff that you wouldn't really think about. The photograph of the... Uh, cleared land in 1965 and the cleared land in 2000. That has an impact. When you look sure. at oh, it, yeah. you're thinking, holy it's striking. smoke. The difference I, I is striking. Mean, yeah. and, and, and that, 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 that uh, the, 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 sort of the closing given us thought about the future of the river and how every single person, visitors from Kansas City or Louisiana, have the, have the same responsibility as do those of us who actually live right there. And, and, and I think that that's part of the greatness of this particular book is, is without being a um, tree-hugger book, it really gives a message for everybody to hear. Yeah. Yeah. How important to the people of Arkansas is the Buffalo River? How valuable is it to them? I don't think you can put a dollar amount on it. No, no. Um, you know, you know, I always tell people, the guests of uh, Buffalo Outdoor Center, that, that, that this river will hold its own with any river on earth. And when you think of that, um, you're talking the Grand Canyon, the Food La Fu in Chile, the uh, Alaskan rivers, the Nile, uh, uh, any river on earth, the Buffalo River will hold its own in comparison to that river. So it's very valuable. It's 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 a it's a it's probably the crown jewel of Arkansas natural resources and tourism products. Do you think the book does a good job of conveying that that sense of value?
conveying what the river really is worth think, to all of us. I, I think that it does in, a, in, in that aspect as far as, once again, he's telling a story here. He's not trying to sell the river. Right, absolutely. He's, he's telling a story. So, uh, once again, I'll refer back to how, how um, it's, it's the way he wants us to protect it. That's where that value mm -hmm. comes out at. And that's Ken, the under, really the underneath Ken. And, and I've known him since 1967, and, and, and that's him. Yeah. And so there, that's the message there. The, the value is, is not projected. It's just underlying. Yeah, but you can find it. You can, you can find you it. You can find it in there. What else besides the, the Tyler Ben thing that you found in the book that surprised you, Larry Foley? Well, I mean, there are a lot of things in there. I'd, I'd been by um, Rush. Uh, that's mm -hmm. where the, the ghost old, town is, sure, right? And, and you know, I knew it was an abandoned mining town, but I really didn't know what they mined there. Uh, and I've been to the Buffalo many, many times, but he goes into talking about that. And, um, you know, I think that the depth of what Ken writes about is as important as anything. Maybe you knew a little bit of something, but he goes into more depth. Uh, and, and just to, to pick up on what Mike was saying, uh, there is no place like the Buffalo, and one of the things that you feel when you're reading this book is that you feel the way Ken feels about it and how important he feels. It is a very special place. It's sort of become his special place, like it's become a lot of other people's sure. special place. And um, I'm, gl you know, goodness knows how much time he spent working on this, but I think we are grateful, and I think generations are going to be grateful that he did this work because it really is going to be an important piece of work for a long time, I think. All right. Larry Foley, Mike Mills, Dana Stewart, thanks for coming down here and visiting with sure. us on this one. Good yeah. job. Thanks. Great to be here. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today on On the Same Page, and we'll see you next time. You can carry it with you in the canoe. It's pretty easy. You know, the idea is that you can take it, and it is an all-year guide to the river, and that the buffalo is an all-year uh, what I'll call a scenic resource. The Buffalo River Handbook is coordinated with Trails Illustrated Topographic Maps. For more information about AETN Presents on the same page, visit AETN.org.